is Hanoi, Vietnam. Happy New Year! I'm Rachel Parsons and I travel alone all over the world to show you that traveling solo doesn't have to be so scary. And then being alone doesn't mean you're lonely. So come on, don't wait for anyone to go with. The world is not going to wait for you. Don't be afraid. Coagulated big blood. Don't be afraid. Be a peregrine dame. Like a lot of people my generation, my father served in the U.S. war in Vietnam. When I first thought of coming to Vietnam, I thought briefly of going into the South and trying to perhaps retrace some of his steps through the country. But the truth is, the propensity to cling to what we know as the Vietnam War, what is known here as the U.S. war in Vietnam, uh, is a very American propensity. The Vietnamese let it go very, very quickly. It scarred plenty of people on this side of the line as well as ours. But the truth is, the Vietnamese have a history that lasts more than a thousand years of kicking invaders out. So the hard truth is, the U.S. war in Vietnam was a very small blip on a very big radar. I'm aware there are still plenty of people on both sides living with the physical and emotional scars. But it's time for me to see Vietnam as it is now. So instead, I've decided to come to modern Vietnam, Hanoi, the capital city, alone, like usual, and see what this country really is today. I chose Hanoi because I heard it has a very rich art and music scene and a vibrant city center. But I've opted to stay out of the central district in which most travelers stay. Originally, I had a hotel room booked in Hanoi in the old quarter or close to it. The old quarter is the original mercantile district of the city, now catering to the foreigners who flock here from around the world. I didn't want to stay in the heavily touristed area of Hanoi. It is the cultural heart of the place. But I really wanted to be able to dig into the, the modern culture here, into the day-to-day -day life. So I hopped on my favorite free local host website and found a woman my age willing to host me in her home in the neighborhood of Dinh Kong. But she's leaving for a week. So she handed me the keys to her home and said, please water my plants, have fun, I'll see you in a week, and left. So I have ended up with this large two-bedroom apartment all to myself in a working class, just an average Hanoi neighborhood. Which seems strange on the face of it, but this is the kind of thing that can happen for independent travelers. People develop a trust, uh, and we reach out to one another, and we rely on one another, for better or worse. And I can tell you, I've never experienced the worst doing this. I always experience the better. I always experience the better of people. Uh, and in this case, I have a free place to live for for the time I'm here, and it's all to myself for a week. So I couldn't have asked for anything better. Can bad things happen? Yes. Be smart, but don't go around expecting the worst. No matter what part of the city you stay in, getting around Hanoi is straightforward enough. If you're in the city center, taxis, or moto taxis called Siom are good, but the bus system is also quite good. Buses are probably the easiest to figure out and the easiest mode of transportation. The nice thing is they go pretty slowly. They're not like getting on a Siom or a moto taxi that's gonna go at 4,000 miles an hour. You can actually appreciate the views of the city out them. Bus stops are clearly marked. Routes are defined. It costs right around 7,000 dong or roughly 30 cents for a ride which is still much less expensive than if you want to cross town with a moto taxi and certainly a traditional taxi, which are metered, but they're not much less expensive than what you might expect in a city in the U.S. So take your pick. The ohms are fun if you can take the traffic in Hanoi. I'm eager to poke around Hanoi's art scene. But by happy circumstance, I've also arrived in Vietnam just in time for the Lunar New Year, or Tet, and the whole city is buzzing in anticipation of the celebration. 
I love being in countries for their biggest celebrations and cultural festivities. I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but in Hanoi for Tet, there is such an energetic calm. Everything is peaceful. Everybody, everybody seems very happy, very content. But uh, there's still a there's a good energy in the air. This new lunar year happens to be the year of the sheep or ram, which happens to be my animal sign. It's supposed to be pretty unlucky, unfortunately, but I think at the moment. I consider myself pretty darn lucky. With a couple of days left to go before the New Year festivities, that luck has led me to a venerable gallery and a mainstay of the Hanoi art scene. Tucked away in a peaceful little courtyard off an alleyway at number 22, Hai Ba Trung. Maisons des Arts is an oasis in the middle of this madness. Its owner has been a patron and an influencer of the community here for years. My name is Nga Nguyen, and I start the Maison des Arts uh, in Hanoi uh, in 2006. Ms. Nguyen began Maison des Arts with the intention of bridging the divide between Hanoi's artistic generations. With the heritage of um, our own very old culture, um, uh, after the long, long uh, time of wars, I think the artists uh, now, today, have a, a lot of things uh, to say uh, through the, their art. During the war, you know, all the artists was, uh, uh, have to paint for the propaganda. Uh, and after the war, now the new generation of artists feel something very strong to express their art and their feeling. The gallery's current show is built around raising awareness of Miss Wynne's campaign to build a museum on the aging Long Bien Bridge, one of Hanoi's iconic structures. The newfound artistic freedom extends to Hanoi's young musicians as well. Before she left, my host Tram introduced me to Mai, who's brought me out tonight. Mai's clearly got a face for TV, but every time I point the camera at her, she runs. I'd have had no way of knowing about Cafe Who without a local, so make sure you make friends. These young people are among the first generation to grow up since the government instated Doi Moi, the reforms aimed at opening Vietnam's economy to the world in 1986. The West's cultural diffusion has done the rest. Hub, a musician's collective project, has embraced styles of music that the player's grandparents would have never dreamt they'd hear in Hanoi. Hub's organizer, as translated through Mai, is for one glad of the cross-cultural influence that's taken hold. As many of the traditional arts were suppressed or lost during Vietnam's cultural revolution, so were some technical crafts. Mai's next stop for us is a place where people are determined to regain and share some of that lost knowledge. Tucked down another tiny alleyway in the neighborhood of Vinh Phuc is Conseil Art, an informal group dedicated to bringing artisanal craftsmanship to the average public. I'm fortunate enough to have connected with some really young people here in Hanoi, and it does seem like a very young city. And one of the most beautiful things about that is that there's a good counterculture. The Conseil Art is an excellent example of that counterculture. Brainchild of native Din Kong Le, the group found a kindred spirit in French expat Mario Bells. Together, Le Kong and Mario help empower everyday people by teaching them to repair and sometimes build their own motorbikes. The relatively rapid shift to a freer economic market and capitalism has changed Hanoi. Le Kong started the group as a response to Hanoi's increasing sprawl and commercialism. He sensed a growing fragmentation and a social disconnect. For him, to work on bikes is much more than a simple physical hobby. You need some, some, some soul, some feeling, something true with you. Mario was inspired by the group's enthusiasm to learn. I feel the motivation and the interest. I mean, they, they really want to know how, but they don't know how to step the first step. 
so the philosophy is, connection and community spirit combined with technical knowledge leads to self-improvement. If they can get a little bit the technique, something for welding, for cut metal, for ride motorcycle, they can feel stronger. This uh, motorcycle is not the purpose, it's just a medium. Everyone can get his own bike and go riding and discover this uh, the spirit he speaks about. Maybe uh, many people come here, they're bank manager or communication manager, and they want something for feel free. They order a bike and they, they feel so proud and can feel the wind again. And easy rider, you know? <laughs> of course, you can guess what comes next. You can try it. Yeah. Here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, let, let, let me. So. Look, I don't know how to ride a bike. And despite Mario's ample instruction, I still have questions. I don't know, where, where are the brakes? The brake is this and rear, rear one. There is no way this is going to work out well. Wow. <laughs> okay, give it, give it, give it, give it, give it, little bit, slowly. Easy rider, I am. <laughs> you got it? I beg, I beg. It's definitely, uh, it's a funny feeling. It's a funny okay, feeling. Okay, okay, run, run, run. And Mario zoomed up that ramp and out into a street with a million other bikes on it. It was electrifying. This sense of family is actual as well as metaphorical. This property is Lekong's family home, even more to my benefit because his father has a surprise for me. The ancient art of calligraphy in Vietnam is very strong, and it's customary during Tet to get pieces made for good fortune in the new year. Kong's wife tells me that the characters symbolize people's hopes for the new beginning. <laughs> they wish for the long living, they wish for uh, health, they wish for happiness. Though the skill is often passed down from master to student, Le Kong's father is self-taught. How long did it take him to learn to do this? Nó hỏi bố mất bao nhiêu lâu để có thể viết được chữ như này? Phải mất 5 đến 10 năm. Viết để hiểu nó phải 5 đến 10 năm. Yes. He said that to know how to write it take around 7 to 10 years, but uh, to write beautiful, you I think it need a lot of talented and practice right, every day, right. yes. Like, so he learned, I mean, you could learn the rudimentary basics in a decade or so, but to, to master this, you just, your lifetime. Yes. Yeah. In the spirit of the new year, my extremely gracious host sends me off with a symbol of good luck. This particular combination of characters is actually a good luck charm. It should bring me luck and happiness and fun and enjoyment. But as it was explained to me, it really only works if the person who creates it has the power to infuse it with that kind of protection and that kind of blessing. I don't really believe in spiritual superstition. What I do believe in are, are humans. The more I travel, as cliched as it may sound, uh, the more I travel, the more I start to believe in humanity and in, in my fellow <laughs> my fellow creatures. Uh, so what I do believe in is the goodness and the kindness uh, that exists in the man that, that painted this for me. And I think that has power. Like so many others around the world, these people who didn't know me hours ago have shown me hospitality and kindness as if I were an old friend. Speaking of old friends, my disappearing apartment host, Tram, is back and since it's Lunar New Year's Eve, she's got another treat for me before midnight strikes. I make my way to meet her at Ho Jam, the lake adjacent to the Temple of Literature, which was built nearly a thousand years ago. Because it's so auspicious to have a calligraphic character painted at the New Year, everyone comes out for one, and the park around the lake is the place to be to have a piece made. Tram is a psychologist by profession who herself studies the age-old art of calligraphy under one of Vietnam's preeminent artists, Dr. Gung Lok. In between creating characters for guests and customers, the doctor holds court for his students who have gathered for some New Year inspiration. 
And before you write me, insisting that I really do have a camera crew, one of Dr. Kung's students has offered to film some of this for me. I have no way of knowing how old he is, but something tells me he's seen a thing or two. And when he can't see because the power running through the park goes out, his students improvise, and he finishes the piece he's working on for me by phone light. We bid the venerable old master good night and make our way toward the edge of the old quarter to another lake, Wan Kiem, for a New Year's Eve custom that's recognizable the world over. People have been gathering at Wan Kiem Lake for hours now. It's every bit got the air of any New Year's Eve festivity in the States, except it's warmer than most of those festivities. Happy New Year! <laughs> Happy New Year from Hanoi! There are always pros and cons with coming to a country during its biggest celebrations, especially in a capital city. Uh, but I think, frankly, it's worth the headache. Travel within the country, as one example, can be very sticky during Tet. But I think celebrating holidays with locals is a priceless way to get to know and exist inside the culture. After the public festivities on New Year's Eve, most of Hanoi shuts down for a quiet few days of private family celebrations. If you're heading here during Tet and not staying in the tourist hub of the city center, it can be hard to find any open restaurant or food shop, so have provisions handy. Yes, enjoy the peace and quiet because things are about to get rowdy. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Dong Ki Firecracker Festival. Located in Bok Ninh, the province to the east-northeast of Hanoi, the festival begins on the fourth day of every Lunar New Year and draws crowds from all over. The Dong Ki Firecracker Festival is incredible. It is a ways out of town. It's probably a 40, 45 minute drive to the east, so it's not close. If you wanted to do it by bus, you could, but it would take quite a while. So I had decided to hook up with a group that I found organizing a trip there through a couchsurfing website that I enjoy using. Organizers and locals from Hanoi's couchsurfing.org group arranged to take anyone who wants to go out to Donkey Village where the festival is held. The festival was originally held to honor a historical figure, General Dian Guang, whose legend states that he helped ancient Vietnamese kings defeat invaders to this area thousands of years ago. It's said that he celebrated his victory by exploding two huge firecrackers. Don't worry, all these firecrackers are made of wood. These days in Vietnam, I've been told firecrackers are illegal, so these are all models. The procession snakes through the village and it ends on the grounds of the local temple. Young, usually single men, bear the loads. But this is where things get sticky. The procession culminates in a raucous pageant inside the enclosed temple grounds, and four elders reenact the ancient battles, symbolically speaking, anyway. Everything I can do to hang on to the camera. I'm way too short for this kind of stuff. The procession of the four generals in that courtyard, from a sheer mass of humanity point of view was one of the most dangerous things I've ever experienced. I'm trapped in the middle of the group. I can't see anything. People are pushing and shoving. I'm trying to get a shot with the camera, which I just had to give up because it was useless. And it very nearly became a stampede at points. So if you go, and you should, go see it. Find yourself a perch on something high and stay there. Unless you're a fairly large individual, it's, it's not going to be great for you. Problem is, there's really no way out. I make it out alive and manage to find my group, only to find that some of them have had an entirely different problem in the crowd. But the crowd is incredible in more than one way. Two people in this group have been pickpocketed on the grounds of this temple. In fact, one had her bag ripped open. She didn't notice that her bag had been slashed open and someone had reached in and grabbed her wallet out. 
yeah, it's a spiritual festival, I suppose, but there are some decidedly unspiritual people in the crowd. So do what you would always do, even if you were in a large crowd back home. Keep an eye on your stuff. Keep a hand on your stuff. Stay aware of your surroundings, but don't be suckered into thinking that everyone in another country is out to get you. Carry your bag in front of you, or better yet, if you can go without one, do so. After so many days of festivities and city life, I'm ready for a little R&R. &R. Incidentally, there's one locale left in northern Vietnam I have to see that perfectly lends itself to that pursuit. Situated on the Gulf of Tonkin, between three and four hours from Hanoi, UNESCO World Heritage Site Halong Bay, including its neighboring bay, Lan Ha, is one of the most awe-inspiring landscapes I've only ever seen in photos. There are a couple of jumping off points for Halong Bay. Halong City has been the standard for many years, but rather than go to Halong City, which has become overrun with tourists, I've decided to head to Kat Ba Island on the west side of Halong Bay, a quieter, less touristed area. To do that from Hanoi, there are several options. You can book the trip piecemeal via rail or bus, but there are several legs to the voyage. Or you can find an organized tour group that leaves from Hanoi. If you're familiar with this show, you know how much I love me an organized tour. So I've steered well clear of that option. I've opted for the third easier option, and that is to book a ticket all the way from Hanoi straight through to Kat Ba Town on Kat Ba Island via a bus service called Wong Long. This ticket involves a bus and onto another bus, some of which have toilets and some of which don't. The ride from Hanoi to Haiphong, the first leg, can be three hours, so plan liquids accordingly. All in all, it's a fairly easygoing trip. And since I left Hanoi in the morning, I still have most of the day to enjoy the bay. The winter months in Southeast Asia are the high season, but for Halong Bay and Kat Pa Island, it's the low season which means you not only get cooler, but still very comfortable temperatures for the mountain biking, hiking, kayaking, and mountain climbing, you also get fewer people and much lower rates. The hotel room that I got at the Chuha Hotel that's normally around $21 cost me eight. But that's not where I'm going to stay tonight. If you've got more than a couple of nights, staying on land is economical but I don't, so I decide to spend as much time as I can out on the water. I was fortunate to grab a last minute ticket to stay on a junk boat overnight out in the bay from Asia Outdoors, an adventure outfitter. Junk refers to a kind of boat, not the quality. Untold generations have lived on the water in this corner of the world, surviving on fishing and, now, tourism. To keep its World Heritage Site designation, authorities work hard to keep the region's tourism sustainable and responsible. For around a hundred bucks, my ticket includes dinner and breakfast, and local entertainment. <laughs> this is incredible. I'm on that boat all night with a tiny crew, like two people, three people, one guide, and two other guests. All right, yes, I guess that makes it an organized tour. Forget what I said earlier. In this case, it makes sense. We've docked at a floating restaurant where we pick out dinner, then enjoy post-dinner libations with the proprietors. It's a pretty safe bet. Whenever you see a soda bottle with clear liquid in it in these parts, it's not water. It's usually a locally made rice wine that, when imbibed, more closely resembles moonshine. It's impolite to leave any in the glass. You couldn't swing a cat in Vietnam without hitting a karaoke machine. So inevitably, these festivities turned to vocalizing. I'd sing for you, but I can't afford to license a Beatles song. 
Gavrila, my guide, is much better than I am, anyway. <laughs> After an evening of socializing, excellent food, strong hooch, and all the singing I can handle, it's easy to drop into dreamland on the top deck and wake up to the misty karst peaks. find in your travels that are interesting, countries you'll find that are fascinating even, and then once in a while there's a place that really grabs you, a place that you know you'll come back to, a place that you know that you could live in for a while. For me, Vietnam is one of those places. The sign of the sheep on the lunar calendar might be considered an unlucky sign by some, but this sheep feels pretty darn lucky.